Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, I think, a pretty fascinating list of 16 programmatic string quartets. That means they are about other things. And this is remarkable, at least the way I think about these things, because, you know, the string quartet is supposed to be the highest and most abstract form of instrumental music, a, a, a form that deals with pure emotion and utter sublimity and total elevated thought and, you know, all of that nonsense. And, and actually, there are quite a few very beautiful and powerful and important and wonderful string quartets which are about other things more mundane things, stories, autobiography, all kinds of stuff. And I, I, you know, I mean, that's not what they're supposed to be. And for those of you who are, you know, like big orchestral music people or beginners trying to get into this stuff who think that the string quartet is something somewhat like divorced from mundane reality or something that takes a certain higher level of something or other before you get into, these might be just the ticket because they are usually quite warm and approachable. Well, most of them, some of them a little less so, or a little bit more. There are avant-garde ones too, but that's the point. The point is that they, they offer a means of entry um, if you are a little bit intimidated by the medium, or if you feel that that you like simply to see what you can do with a string quartet that isn't just, you know, it's like, oh, play a fugue, put have a sonata form, do a scherzo, you know, play an adagio. You know what I mean, right? They, they, they emphasize sometimes color and texture in a way that more normal string quartets might not. Let's go through the list and you can judge for yourself. So we must start. We must with the two magnificent string quartets by Leos Janáček. Janáček is I mean, he's an amazing composer, but both of his string quartets, and they're among the great 20th century masterpieces in the medium, everybody agrees with that, are programmatic. The first string quartet is based on Tolstoy's story, The Kreutzer Sonata, which is actually about domestic abuse. It's about the abuse of women, and it's, it's quite a passionate and and violent and sad piece. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. The second is subtitled Intimate Letters or Intimate Pages or, 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 you know, you know, pornographic diary. I mean, whatever you want to call it. Janicek, when he hit his 70s, fell in love with a much younger woman named Kamila Stoslova. And Kamila Stoslova was married. She had a kid. She was a very a nice, happy little Jewish lady, actually. And she was like 40 years younger than he was. And she wasn't quite sure what to make of it because he wrote something like 500 passionate letters to her, which apparently were never returned. Um, he planned his vacations around where she was. You know, when he died, he like left everything to her as his honorary wife and his real wife, who he hadn't spoken to. I mean, they were on, not on speaking terms, but they were not divorced either. Um, had to go to court to like get her settlement. He was really a little nutty about it. He was completely infatuated by her. And his obsession with her produced the magnificent operas of his you know, late period, because all of them feature a strong, interesting female character who who was embodied in in Kamila, and so his his passion and his obsession um, was was somehow sublimated and reduced to string quartet number two. And boy, is that intense! Oh my goodness, what a piece of music it is! So there's number two, number three, totally totally different world. Tournemir, the French composer, Tournemir, who was known mostly as an organist, one of those organ guys like Vidor and Franck and all that. He wrote this enormous cycle of, of liturgical organ music called L'Orgue Mystique. He also wrote a bunch of really rather cool symphonies, eight of them to be, to be exact, um, that desperately need new modern complete recordings. 
because he was quite talented. He also did a Tristan and Isolde oratorio. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. He was a real nut job. And some of his chamber music, there isn't very much, but he did write a string quartet called Musique Orante, which is music of prayer. Um, I mean, that's sort of how it translates, or, or supplication. You know, Orant, it, it, it's, you know, the vision of somebody, you know, like this, you know, <laughs> praying. Um, that, that's what it is, and that's what this string quartet represents. It's a lovely work, a fascinating work. It's been recorded several times um, in collections of French quartets or chamber music because French composers tend to write like just one string quartet, so you need to find a bunch of them <laughs> to put together. And he's usually, um, he's like stuck in the bunch because it's like a 19 or 20 minute long piece in like one big movement, sort of more or less. Anyway, it's, it's a, a remarkable work by a, a very remarkable composer who doesn't get much play. So if you see it, if you come across it, you might want to give it a shot. It's about sacred things. Exactly what the sacred things are, we, we leave up to each listener. So after Tornemir, Herbert howls. This is the opposite of prayer. This is nice and earthy. His string quartet number three in Gloucestershire, which I did a little video about. I mean, Howells is a lovely composer, a wonderful minor master, you might call him, in the English pastoral school. Um, he wrote some great choral works. That's what he's best known, best known for, his Requiem and Hymnus Paradisi. And also uh, some big mass settings, choral and or orchestral things, very complex, some beautiful music for strings, and this really lovely, lovely string quartet, which is kind of Vaughn Williams-y English pastoral st school, but very lovely and evocative and full of atmosphere and good tunes. And oh, you're gonna love it. You're really gonna love it. And it's about being in Gloucestershire. Go there, go to Gloucestershire. Think of quartets, and you're in business. Then, oh, here, this one is really fun. Joachim Raff, you know Raff. Raff wrote, wrote, wrote a bunch of symphonies, programmatic symphonies, the Leonora Symphony. He was uh, Liszt's orchestrational assistant at one point, and, and he just churned out tons and tons of music, a lot of which is surprisingly good. He wasn't perfect. He could be kind of prolix. His handling of large forms could be a little iffy, but a lot of the music is just really enjoyable. And his string quartet number seven is based on Die Schöne Müllerin, like Schubert, Die Schöne Müllerin. It's not based on Schubert at all. It's based on the same poems, the same story. Uh, we don't have any evidence that Raff was even aware of Schubert's song cycle when he wrote his seventh quartet but they are based on the same tune. And you know what it's about. It's the fair maid of the mill, and there's a guy who's in love with her, and it's all about their non-relationship or relationship or whatever it is. So so there you go. I mean, there is another Die Schöne Müller, and Miller lady thing out there, and it isn't by Schubert, and it's a string quartet. That's a real novelty. That's one of those things that it's been recorded. It's on, on, on um, Tudor and very nicely recorded. And, you know, it's really one of those, it's a great piece. I mean, get your hands on it and sort of, you know, dazzle your classical music snotty friends with the other Schöne Müller and, and ask them, you know, where it came from. It's actually just a very tuneful, enjoyable, sweet-like quartet. It's, it's nice. And uh, you'll you'll get a kick out of it. You really will. Then, oh, now we're going to get really complex. This just goes to show you that these programmatic quartets can come in all shapes and sizes. Berg's Lyric Suite. Now, the Lyric Suite is called that because it quotes from Zemlinsky's Lyric Symphony. And, I mean, go find the quotation. <laughs> I, I've never been able to be bothered to do it. But the Lyric Suite is is a a 12-tone, partly a 12-tone work in several movements. Um, and it apparently, we discovered later, details the course of one of Berg's love affairs. And we know who the affair was with, and probably so did Berg's wife, much to her dismay. But the original lyric suite in its original string quartet form um, um, really is very passionate and intense and spooky and it's it's the great 
um, second Viennese school string quartet masterpiece, I think. Not, notwithstanding Schoenberg's quartets, about which we will be considering one momentarily. So after Berg, we're going to stay in the 20th century, Dutilleux, the great French composer who was extremely limited in his output, a very fastidious, a real craftsman. He worked very, very long and intensely on everything that he wrote. And he wrote one string quartet called Ainsi la nuit, Thus the Night. I have no idea what that means, and I have no idea what the string quartet is about other than Thus the Night. But it's really rather cool. Very atmospheric, challenging piece, big, long, single movement extravaganza. Uh, but you know, all of duty is worth listening to. It really is because uh, it is nocturnal. I'll give it that. And exactly what is happening in the night and, and what makes it thus, I, I haven't a clue. But it's about something. And that's the point when you have titles to, for you know, otherwise sort of abstract works. They, they're supposed to make you think, help you focus your, your listening, not so much on whether it sounds like it's like night, you know, but on the fact that it's about something. And what that something is, is, is up to you as, as an imaginative and intense listener. And you, you, give, it your, you give it your best bet. Some funny little noise back there. Something is short circuiting, of course, in my sound system. Big surprise. It's gotten a lot of use over the years. So, and after Ancy, 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 La Nuit. Oh, this one is fun too. Bernard Herrmann, his single string quartet. It's called Echoes. And it's echoes of the past. It's nostalgic. It's echoes of time. And exactly what those echoes are, again, um, is, is your call. But we're talking about Bernard Herrmann, the 20th century's greatest composer of film music. And all of his music, in a sense, is theatrical music. It's film music and it, it's scenic music. And his string quartet is no less than anything else. It has some great tunes. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful work. It deserves more attention than it gets for sure, because, you know, Harman also wrote a symphony and some other things. His concert music is, is, is beautifully crafted, and it sounds like Hermann, and it's really wonderful. So believe it or not, there is a wonderful street quartet out there, and it's called Echoes. Go figure what the echoes are echoing, and you can report back after you've determined what they are. So now we're going to talk about a couple of other modernist quartets. Schoenberg, string quartet number two. It's programmatic by virtue of the fact that it has a part for a soprano, and she's singing song texts in some of the movements. And so, I mean, the whole quartet obviously is organized and based on the song stuff, um, of, you know, and the rest of it leads up to it and descends from it and focuses on it, and, and the words determine what the program is. So I don't have to go into what the words are. You you read the words when you listen to the quartet. It's actually rather a cool piece. It really is. I, although I, last time I saw it was not under ideal circumstances. I was at the, the Kuchmo Chamber Music Festival in Finland, which is like above the, or at the Arctic Circle. And in the summer, so the sun never quite goes down. And I was like up and I was exhausted. And we sat in this, in this they have a beautiful concert hall there, a beautiful wood paneled concert hall that's actually a movie palace in the winter when they're not doing the chamber music festival they show films there and and it was it was hot and it wasn't actually all that well ventilated and they were doing the Schimberg second quartet and that's all I remember because I slept through the whole thing so there you go but it does have a soprano I, I remember that part and if, I have it on recordings of course where I can you know be alert and awake when I'm when I'm listening to it it's much harder when you're like, you know, a guest at a festival and, and you're supposed to be running around all the time doing this stuff and it, it, it can be quite tiring. Uh, so yeah, Schoenberg Second String Quartet. And the natural companion to that is Alberto Ginastera's Third String Quartet, which also has a soprano. She's singing about, you know, the evils of war, the sorrow of war and whatnot. And it's a wonderful expressionistic piece, really full of 
full of gnarly harmony and, and extraordinary anguished sounds and your soprano screaming at you and oh my goodness, it's as programmatic as programmatic gets. It really is. And, and Hinnester is wonderful. He's such a fun composer, even in his late expressionistic or dodecaphonic or whatever period, the music is so recognizably his and, and so full of atmosphere and tension and rhythm. And, oh, goodness, it's fun. So Hinnester is up there. Then we've got Shostakovich's Eighth Quartet, which we know is autobiographical. I mean, Shostakovich was apparently contemplating suicide. He just you know, unwillingly joined the Communist Party. He was trying to, he was fighting for his survival, basically. And the Eighth Quartet, I mean, exactly again, what's going on in it, no one's really sure. But boy, oh boy, is it intense and powerful. It's his most popular string quartet. It was turned into a chamber symphony. Um, it uses his, his DSCH musical motto, the one that has his, his initials, ba da 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 I mean, that's how it starts, that's how it ends. It's all about him. And what it says is awfully disturbing, but also very, very beautiful and extremely powerful. And it's related to lots of other works that he wrote, and it's part of the whole interior monologue that, that flows through his music in so many different parts. So Shostakovich's Eighth Quartet. Then, oh, this was fun. Alan Hovannis, Hymn of the 67 Symphonies. Um, Hovannis wrote a bunch of string quartets, too. Um, he wrote two in his Opus 208, numbers one and two. One of them is subtitled um, Recollections of My Childhood in New England. So we know exactly what that one's about, it's in two movements. And the other one is, it's about a tree. It's called something like the mysterious tree or the giant magical epic tree. So it's doing a tree. So you've got like a nature one and you've got one about his childhood in New England. And if you like Hovannis, you're going to like the quartets. They are. They're very pretty. They're lovely pieces and fun to listen to. And they're really, uh, really, you know, he's a surprising composer. It's like anyone else. He tends to get misjudged by people who haven't bothered to listen to his music because, you know, he, everyone knows Mysterious Mountain and everyone says everything sounds the same <laughs> like that. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But like all composers who are hugely prolific, um, you know, and these, like I said, these two quartets are from Opus 208, uh, you, you have to take each piece as it comes. And these two quartets are good pieces. They're, they're, they're interesting pieces and fun to listen to. So yeah, Havana, String Quartets 3 and 4. I bet you haven't sung those recently. After that, well, two quartets by the, two more quartets actually, by the Danish composer Rud Langyard, or Langard, or Lang, however you pronounce it. And, and, and again, don't ever tell me. I don't care. I don't want to know. Don't get into pronunciation. We don't have time. The list of all these things are down below. The names are correctly spelled. You can look them up yourself. And if you're Danish, you can talk to each other about them. Anyway, he wrote a lot of quartets and a lot of them are programmatic, but I'm talking about two of them, which I've listed here separately because they deserve, one is a formal string quartet, number two, and the other is a string quartet thing. Now, there's no way I'm going to be able to tell you what these are about without getting out my handy dandy complete string quartets on Da Capo with the Nightingale String Quartet, which I have talked about. Um, here we go. So let's see what they're about. This is really very, very interesting. Uh, there's all kinds of like string quartet music. Okay, number two. Here we go. Storm clouds receding, then train passing by, landscape in twilight, and the walk. Now, that is pretty programmatic. That is, is very, very graphic as to what is happening in the four movements of this quartet, especially the uh, train passing by, which is rather fun. Then there's this other thing here, wait a minute, called Rose Garden Play. That's the other quartet I'm talking about, which is also a four movement string quartet. It simply isn't numbered as such. And the movements are interior, the interior of something, and then Mozart, well, we know what Mozart is about, and then drop fall. I don't think that's jumping out of a plane with a parachute, but it's called drop fall. He also wrote something called leaf fall, you know, fall of a leaf or 
it's something like that. You know, it's that kind of, you know, autumnal thing falling. And then there's there's the last movement, Rococo, and it's about Rococoosity. So there's two, and they're wonderful pieces. These are fun to listen to and enjoyable and tuneful and kind of strange in places. Um, sometimes you don't know what period it is or what you're listening to and why. It's 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 definitely definitely an experience. His string quartets are in this beautiful box. Like I said, I've talked about this before. It's it's great stuff, absolutely great stuff. It's three CDs, well worth hearing. And then, well, we've got two more to go. Arthur Farwell. This is a recent release. It just came out on Naxos. His string quartet in A major, subtitled The Hako. The Hako is an, an American Indian ritual, or Native American ritual, if you want to be politically correct. Um, Farwell was, was a, a fascinating composer who tried to d take Dvorak's advice, literally, and develop a, a genuine American music based on um, indigenous music. And so he used all of these ideas. Uh, apparently, the Hako doesn't quote any specific, you know, Native American themes, but it's based on his experience of um, one of those spiritual ce ceremony things. Um, and it, it's a beautiful work and a fascinating work. And it doesn't sound like anything else anybody else wrote. And like I said, it's on the one of the Arthur Farwell discs on Naxos. Um, Farwell is not getting much attention now and probably won't because he has been accused. Um, I mean, he lived to like the 1950s, but he's been accused of, of cultural appropriation. And so no one wants to touch his stuff. Uh, especially the stuff based on Native American uh, themes and ideas, and oh, it's a tragedy! It's a tragedy. We are we are so sadomasochistic when it comes to our cultural heritage, and and the idea and I've said this before and raved about it that anybody owns anything culturally is is stupid and grotesque and primitive and silly, and I, I have no hesitation in calling it out for what it is. That kind of wokeness is doom to culture and the arts, because the whole beauty of a culture is what it offers to all of us. The wonderful variety and things, it's nobody's private possession. I mean, oh, that's just such a, such a terrible position to take, and to and Farwell was a very, very serious artist, somebody who loved and admired and respect the cultural tradition that he wanted to work with, that he was trying to integrate into the broader stream of Western music. And you might not like it, you might not like what he did, you might object to it, but good heavens, it's not the same thing as naming your sports team the Redskins or something like that. This is, this is, this is something he's doing out of love and admiration with craft and intelligence. And it's, it's, it's the melding of cultures. A wonderful, wonderful thing. Period. So there. And finally, that's it. Now that I've done my, my preaching, finally the quartet that is the beginning and ending of all autobiographical string quartets. Smetna's number one, subtitled From My Life. This we really know about because he had, he went deaf. He had tinnitus and, and it was, he had a, nasty piercing tone that wouldn't go away and you hear that in the finale of this quartet it's very very clear it's about his life and how happy it was before the onset of his deafness and it's an extremely scary tragic moment and it's also just a brilliant string quartet a wonderful wonderful work and uh, kind of the 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 father of all of the most you know poignant autobiographical string quartets so there you have it 16 fabulous programmatic string quartets, not your usual quartetitude. I mean, you can go out and you can, maybe this will really get you going on string quartets or give you some reason to listen to them other than the fact that, you know, like cod liver oil, they're supposed to be good for you, even though they taste terrible. I mean, of course, that's not true. String quartets are magnificent. They're fun. They're enjoyable. They're everything music can be. But they have this 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 chip on their shoulder because of how they're presented to us in our rather horrifying classical music culture and these quartets will i think sort of put that that prejudice or that, that uh, you know all of those that old snooty paradigm 
put it away, get rid of it, throw it in the trash where it belongs to be, and just listen to these fabulous programmatic string quartets. So keep on listening. Friends, thanks for joining me. Take care.